Let's look at one of the famous uh, seemingly paradoxical aspects of quantum mechanics or disturbing aspects of quantum mechanics famously brought up in a paper by um, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, the EPR paper. Um, here's the situation that we've got um, a source uh, that spits out two electrons and it spits out these electrons in a way so that their spins are correlated with each other. Um, you can set up a state like this where there's no spin of the thing that's um, spitting out the electrons. Maybe it's some particle that decays into two, two particles. You can set it up so there's no spin to start with so that any spin that goes out here must be counterbalanced by the spin that goes out here. So um, it's the, the two electrons kind of have no definite spin to start with but each spin is opposite to the other. And in itself it's a little bit of a weird thing to say but that's quantum mechanics for you. Okay, so that's the idea, is that these spins are correlated to be opposite of each other. And then you send them out, and you detect one here, and you detect one here. And you can choose what kind of property to detect in this detector, and what kind of property to, to detect in this detector. So you could detect the X spin here, or the Y spin. You could detect the X spin, or the Y spin here. So here's an example. Um, you measure electron, I'll call this electron 1. You measure the x spin, the x direction of spin in this detector. Um, and you might get x plus or x minus as your two answers. Let's say just for definiteness we get x plus. Well, by the properties of the fact that the total spin was zero that's to start out from the source, we know this would definitely give x minus. That's not that weird. It's inferring from one detec detection of one thing, inferring something about some other particle or something else. That's, you do that all the time in physics. And it's, it's a totally classical analog. Um, for example, if this was somebody sending out two letters, and we knew that he always sends out uh, a letter with a green card in it and a letter with a red card in it. If you get a green card over here, then you know the other one is going to be red. That's not weird so far. Okay. Um, but, you know, we could have made the choice to measure the spin of electron 1 in the y direction as well. And, for example, we could get y plus, or we could get y minus. Say if we got y plus, then we would know for sure that a, de a, a measurement of the y spin in this detector would definitely give y minus. Okay, so it seems like um, in this situation, when the choice has been made to, to measure y and we got a y plus, it seems like this thing was y minus all along. It had a definite value for what y must have been because we know what the detector would give it if we had detected it, it would be give y minus but we also could have chosen to measure the electron one in the x direction well that seems like it means that electron two has a definite answer for what its x spin is as well the opposite of whatever we get over here okay so this seems to say that electron two must already have a definite answer to all possible measurements, or at least these two measurements, the x spin and the y spin. But that's exactly what I've been claiming is impossible in quantum mechanics. They're incompatible properties. You can't say that this electron 2, as it's zooming out of here and on its way to the detector, has a definite value for both the x spin and the y spin. There's fundamental reasons why that's not possible. Um, and, yet, and yet it seems like what we're doing with this detector, the fact that we can make one choice or another to choose the x spin or the y spin, it seems like we're saying this must have that property, even though quantum mechanics says it can't happen. So one way to, uh, to uh, talk about this is that we seem to be getting an answer that's contrary to quantum mechanics. One other way to think about it is that maybe the, de the act of detection or the act of choosing what to detect in, in the detector over here on the left has some, act, some effect on electron 2 or on the detector over here, and that's the other part of the system. Trouble with that is you can set up the experiment so that this detector is fairly far away from this detector, and the electrons are coming in at roughly the same time, so that whatever signal, whatever mysterious action at a distance that might be happening when you choose the detector here, either the x direction or the y direction, whatever influence that that has maybe on this other detector and this other electron would have to propagate much faster than the speed of or significantly faster than the speed of light. Well that's a huge problem because um, relativity says that influences shouldn't go faster than light and in particular if they do go faster than light it violates causality that it's easy to, to show that if you believe even the basic tenets of, of special relativity 
And if you can build an influence that goes faster than light, then you can actually build an influence that goes backwards in time. Uh, and I talk about that in the, the, one of the addendums to, to my relativity videos. Um, and that's very disturbing. We would probably not want to say that's the solution to the puzzle. And we wouldn't even know how that action at distance was happening anyway. It's not part of the model. It's, it's just bizarre, and it would seem to violate relativity and or causality. Okay. So here's what, what uh, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen said about this, is that we think that there really is some property. There, it, that this is, we're going to sort of take it at face value and say that the electron 2 really did have uh, a definite answer for the both the x spin and the y spin, even though quantum mechanics can't access it. They just thought that this means that the quantum mechanics is an incomplete theory. The idea that that um, the x spin and the y spin are fundamentally probabilistic and unpredictable, and there's no way to pin them down. They just said, "Oh, the theory must be incomplete." And this was Einstein, this is really coming out of Einstein's long-standing um, dislike of the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. So that goes by the name of hidden variables. They were basically saying there should be some hidden variables that w that are not in the description of quantum mechanics, but that are kind of oscillating around and bouncing around in a way that seems to to replicate um, probabilistic the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. So it's just that we don't know enough, and that's that's going back to like the uh, for example the bullets shot at the or the the darts shot at the dartboard. We could just measure more precisely what ha what's happening with the darts and predict more precisely what's going on and take the probabilistic aspect out of it. And they were saying, this is an, a clever argument to say that even if you don't mind the prob probabilities, this kind of, of situation where a choice over here seems to affect the choice over here um, seems to suggest that quantum mechanics is incomplete. So one question here is, is this just a matter of philosophy? A lot of what I'm t getting at here is really a matter of how you interpret quantum mechanics, how you think about it, not so much what its predictions are. Uh, but this is one where it was a really important step forward to realize that there's actual predictions you can make and experience you, experiments you can make around the nature of this idea of hidden variables. This is not actually something about just how do you think about quantum mechanics. It actually affects the predictions. Bell and others in the 1960s, they came up with some, uh, some famous inequalities some famous uh, mathematical statements that said that if you have hidden variables of any kind of reasonable type, then um, any theory built on those hidden variables, even though it seems perhaps to replicate some of the aspects of quantum mechanics, you can set up situations where it will give definite and different predictions from actual standard quantum mechanics. And in 19, the 1980s, Aspect and other folks actually managed to set up those experiments and, basi and found exactly that the quantum mechanical description is correct, and hidden variables, just they're just plain wrong. It's not just a, um, an overly complicated way or a, a different way of explaining the quantum mechanical predictions. They'll give the wrong predictions. So um, the EPR, it's still a weird thing to think about, but the conclusion that Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen came to was really incorrect, that there aren't these hidden quantities that we just aren't good enough to detect. They're just, the world is really this weird. Um, so the, the name for this, when you have this weird phenomenon that you have two states, two electrons, these two particles, um, that, that um, you know you can infer various properties about one electron from the properties of the other, we say that those two, the states of the electrons are entangled. And it's definitely a weird prediction of quantum mechanics, but it is fundamental. And nowadays, um, even though it's not something that's intuitive, it's actually gone from being uh, a, pa a pathology of the theory or something weird that we would prefer not to have. It's really an essential tool for quantum computing and quantum encryption. Um, and this is, this is the weird phenomenon that's at the heart of what makes those things work. I'm not going to go into the more of the details of qu quantum computing and encryption in this video, but maybe in some other video. Uh, or maybe there's uh, some other ones out there that you should watch. I don't know. So I want to do a little tiny bit of advertisement for the consistent histories approach. Um, I'm not going to do it justice because um, I don't want to go into the detail. But here's how um, the consistent histories approach would, uh, would describe the EPR situation. This is due to uh, Griffiths, Omnes, and Gilman and Hartle. Those are the four big names um, who invented this approach to quantum mechanics. And it's pretty recent. It's the last uh, 30 or 40 years. The goal of consistent histories is to have an interpretation of quantum mechanics 
that avoids uh, difficulties such as the idea of like the collapse of a state when you measure it. So it's supposed to avoid weird um, putting in these extra phenomena like measurements and collapsing. So here's a very short schematic summary of how that approach would describe EPR. Let's look at a very, very special case, or just a particular case of the EPR situation. Um, statement A is that we measure the X spin of electron 1, and we get the answer plus. It's X plus. Okay. Statement B is we measure Y for electron number 2. We actually go ahead and measure this thing, and we get Y plus. Okay. So that's the situation we're in, and i just summarize that here. So these are the two things that we actually did in the experiment. So here's some logical, st some actual statements about the world um, that we can try to make, and we'll see if they make sense, and we see if they make sense separately or together. Statement one is that, well, because of A, we measured X for electron one, and we got X plus. By the fact that they started out with, with a to zero total spin, electron two must have been in the X minus state before being measured. So that is a statement we can try to analyze. Okay? It's not the actual direct result of an experiment. It's a statement about what must have been happening before the detector was activated based on what we saw in the detectors. Okay, here's statement two. Let's, analyze, let's think about this separately first. Because of B, because of this measurement, the measurement of, of the, uh, the second electron on the right, when we measured the Y state of the electron, we got Y plus. Because of that, well, there's no reason why it would be changing. Like here, there's no reason it would be changing. So it was probably in y plus, the Y plus state all along as it's coming out, and then it hits the detector. There's no, we don't think it would have changed in here. It's, it's set up, we can set it up so that there's no reason to think it would change. So because of this measurement, the electron 2 must have been in a Y plus state before being measured. But remember that what quantum mechanics says is that we're not supposed to say, oh, well, the conclusion is simple. It was definitely in an X minus state and simultaneously definitely in a Y plus state as it was flying towards a detector. That's a meaningless statement. We can't make that statement. And that's really the EPR um, paradox is that it really seems reasonable to combine these two statements. A really does seem to imply on its own statement one, and B really does seem to imply on its own statement two. Can't we just put the word and bef between these two statements? But that's where, we, where it actually um, breaks down, according to the cons consistent histories approach. Okay? What, it, what we say in this approach is that statement one and statement two are separately valid in their own different and unfortunately incompatible descriptions of reality. It's very important. It's not saying that there's two different realities. You, there, you might be thinking of, the, of Everett's many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And this is really quite different uh, philosophically. Um, the idea is there is one reality, but the very strange thing to get used to is that there is a possibility of different and incompatible descriptions. If you set it up very, very carefully, you can set up a very self-consistent framework of statements about this system that includes statement one. And you can set up a different framework, a different set of logical statements, basically a different sort of subset of logic um, that includes statement two. But those frameworks are incompatible with each other in a way that really is, is, is measurable. Um, when you look at the, the, the mathematics, the linear algebra, the equations, there's a very measurable thing that you can actually see. Oh, there is really a, something very different um, about trying to put these two together. The idea is that you have to first figure out what question do you want to answer and then choose a framework. And you might have a list of questions that you want to answer. And unfortunately, those two different questions might belong to different frameworks, and you aren't going to be able to answer them simultaneously. That's a weird thing to say. But as I alluded to before, when, when I talked about Birkhoff and von Neumann in the history, um, their proposal was just as radical and, and almost as compelling from a, a, the point of view of the deep structure of the mathematics of quantum mechanics. They said, we've got to throw out all the rules of logic, or the, some essential rules of logic and always, always, always use a new kind of logic. That is really confusing, unfortunately. This is a kind of a minimal version of that proposal. Um, once you set up a, a, a separate framework, like the framework where we can talk about the measurement of the x, uh, x plus and x minus, then there's a lot of statements you can make, and you use ordinary logic and ordinary probability to get your answers. 
Or you might have to work in a different framework where statement two make, makes sense. And you can use ordinary logic and ordinary probability there. Unfortunately, you just can't combine them. And even though that's a very weird thing, I, I find it fairly compelling because um, we already know there's definitely cases where this is a really good way to think about things. That the statement that one single particle has x minus as its spin and y plus as its spin, we already know that there's obvious, obvious problems with that. And um, the, the simplest thing to say is it's just a, it's just a meaningless statement. People tend to be um, not not go for that kind of solution to this kind of problem, but it's really one of the most elegant solutions that I've seen. Okay, so it's this idea of different frameworks, and if you're gonna do logic and combine statements, they gotta be in the same framework, or it just actually doesn't mean anything. Uh, next, coming up in the next video is a similar analysis, again very schematic and rough, of Schrodinger's cat.